Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing naturalization and citizenship procedures in the United States with special guests. Angelica uh, Salas, Executive Director of the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights in California. Dr. Mitra Savarini, uh, Executive Director of Project Citizenship in Massachusetts. And Jane Graubman, Executive Director of the International Institute of Minnesota. And thank you so much all for, for being here, for joining us today, and for sharing your expertise. I'm just going to set this up because there's been so much recent news coverage about immigration to the United States. And we felt that it was time to talk about American citizenship, its rights and responsibilities. So um, if you take if you take a look at what a citizen is, as opposed to a resident alien, uh, a citizen has voting rights, protection from deportation, family based immigration uh, rights, their employment rights and travel with an American passport. There are also certain social services and benefits that come with American citizenship. But I'd like to talk a little bit about the aspirations of people to become American citizens. Because if you're a resident alien, you have many rights that are so treasured by, by people here in the country. Mitra, could you talk a little bit about Project Citizenship, your work, and your constituents and why they want to become Americans? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for having me, Mark. And it's uh, great to be in and to see that this topic gets um, its ebbs and flows, but it's again, it flowed, has flowed into the American um, narrative and conversation. And for full disclosure, I'm also a naturalized citizen from Iran. It took my family 17 years to become a U.S. citizen. And in the end, it was really the full benevolence of a sympathetic judge who approved our case. In other words, it was more luck than anything else. Um, in, to answer your question, Mark, who is you know, seeking to become US citizen? I think let's put it in a different context. Who is not seeking to become a US citizen? 90% of eligible immigrants, those are permanent residents, or we call them green card holders or LPRs, um, legal permanent residents, do not apply for US citizenship. In the nation, there's 9.1 million folks who have that status in Massachusetts, where I live, 210,000, we're project citizenship, we're in the city of Boston. Um, this means that permanent residents um, are not participating in our democracy, airing their voice, and it's not as though they feel like they belong and they're part of this country. Um, so there are a lot of obstacles uh, to why. I have to say that some LPRs don't apply for US citizenship because they have the privilege of coming from a stable, secure country, European countries, for instance. I have a lot of European friends who have no desire to become US citizens. We gotta give some thought to that. Um, for some nationalities, having a dual citizenship bars them from the rights back in their homeland. So they also don't wanna become US citizens. There's um, a, a few dozen of those nations that fall under that um, purview. And then there's some who really wanna become a US citizen, those we serve, um, for instance, a project citizenship, but it's a really complicated, long process. There's a 20 page application with complicated legalese language. Um, there's an application fee of $725. For some people that might be, not be a lot, but if you're a minimum wage employee holding two or three jobs, supporting a family of four or five, that immediately becomes cost prohibitive. So that application fee is a huge um, obstacle in their course. There's also then a civic exam, an English exam. There's fear of authorities. Um, they feel like I've gotten the green card, I'm safe, I can stay wrongly because they still can be deported. Um, so fear of authorities seems to be uh, one of the obstacles we hear a lot. And then it takes a long time for that application to be approved. After COVID, we're now seeing up to 18 months. Before COVID, it's six months. So it takes a long time for that application to finally be approved by- So you have a bunch of ba barriers, right? I mean, you have, uh, not to mention the fact that many people who live in this country um, are either, they fall under the DACA program or they, they are in some way uh, in the shadows so that they can't actually uh, apply for citizenship. And just for the sake of disclosure, since you disclosed, 
My wife um, actually received her citizenship in Faneuil Hall in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. My father um, was a refugee from Nazi Germany. Um, mm -hmm. And my uh, grandparents on all sides were refugees from uh, Belarus, from, from Nazi Germany, and so on. So um, I think we all have those kinds of stories. Jane, um, talk a little bit about the view from Minnesota. You know, you have a totally different uh, part of the country, and then we'll, we'll uh, go over to California um, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, talk with you, Angelica. Um, but from the view of Minnesota, what is your um, uh, organization, how does your organization approach this very complicated problem? Um, well, in Minnesota, so the International Institute of Minnesota is, um, and thanks for the question mark, and great to be on the panel with Mitra and Angelica. At the Institute, we provide comprehensive services for new Americans, and we are formerly a refugee resettlement agency. So, um, but we serve about 4,000 people a year of all different uh, backgrounds and different status through the immigration uh, program. But about 60% of the people that we're serving in our, in our citizenship program are, are refugees or asylees. Um, so, and I think that's because of a lot of, yeah. And, so and it's, refugees it's, from what countries? Um, so it, Minnesota's gotten a lot more diverse than it has been. Um, you might be surprised to know. So the majority of the folks that we've been serving in the last decade have been from African countries. So of course, Somalia, um, Congo, uh, Ethiopia. Um, those are the largest company, uh, countries that we're serving but also from other West and East African countries. Um, and also Korean refugees from Burma. Minnesota has, I think the largest Korean or one of the largest Korean populations. Um, about 55% of them are female, 45% um, male. So it's fairly even there. Um, and um, they're really all ages, but the majority of them are in their twenties to late forties. And I think um, Mitra and Angelica can talk about this too, but. We definitely notice like right now in the time we are before an election, we see an uptick, especially in presidential elections, we see an uptick in the number of people applying to be US citizens. I don't like to be political to, in my conversations, but um, I, I just have to point out that I've been at the Institute for 32 years. And I think during you know the previous administration um, that there was fear like I've never seen before in the clients that we have. I mean, it was really unprecedented. Um, you know, there's always slight changes from president, presidential administrations, but um, it was really a dramatic change. So we really saw an uptick in the number of people during the Trump administration applying for citizenship um, for their own safety um, and their security. Uh, and also, I think, wanting to vote. But I do also want to say that there is um, an emotional com component to people becoming U.S. citizens. Um, you know, people do say, and, and I totally understand Mitra's point because that's very true. It's all it, it's all the it's all relative where you come from, right, and how safe and secure it is. But many of our clients say that the United States has given them a safe place. Um, you know, safety is relative, but um, but that that there is an emotional reason why they become a U.S. citizen because they feel grateful that they're in a place where there's opportunity for them. So we have here people who are fleeing violence, death, um, who are uh, afraid for their lives. Burma, you have an authoritarian regime, a military junta. Uh, some of these other places that you cited, uh, Somalia and so on, have been plagued by war. Angelica, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly in my in my very poor anglicized uh, pronunciation. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your view from the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights and, and who are you serving? Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Angelica Salas. I'm the executive director of CHIRLA, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights. And um, we're based in California and we serve um, immigrants, uh, low wage immigrants. Uh, we also work very closely with immigrant youth who are in high schools and in, in the universities. Um, and we provide a, a range of services. We organize immigrants. Uh, we provide them community education and outreach, um, give them information about their rights, their resources, um, and also their responsibilities. And that 
part of that responsibility is about participation and civic participation in their communities. Um, uh, the organization, like I said, is based in California and California has more immigrants than any other state in this country. Um, California is, it more, is almost is it more immigrants per capita or is it just more? Immigrants? It's just more, more uh, immigrants. Um, California is home to almost 11 million immigrants. Um, that's the, a quarter of all the foreign born population nationwide. California's population, about 27% of California's uh, population is foreign born. Um, but I think another very important um, data, data point is that uh, oh, um, close to 50% of the children of California have at least one immigrant parent. Um, uh, the majority of the foreign born residents are um, live in, um, in different parts of the, of the state. Um, I work out of Los Angeles where about 34% of that population lives. Um, the other thing that is important is that more than half, about 53% of California's immigrants are naturalized citizens. Um, another 25% are those with legal status. And then about 22% are undocumented. So what we work with is um, immigrants who are low wage workers. Um, uh, Mitra talked about this, about all the different barriers to citizenship. And often um, there are several things that we see. Number one, um, uh, what we see is um, uh, the payment of seven hundred twenty-five dollars um, um, is is significant for many of these workers who work in service industries in agriculture. Um, many of the individuals who are eligible to become citizens are actually of Mexican ancestry. I myself am also a naturalized citizen. I came as a child uh, from the uh, from Mexico. Um, and it wasn't until many years later that I was finally able to become a citizen of the United States. Um, many of the individuals that we work with are also individuals um, who in their home country didn't have a lot of educational opportunities. Um, many maybe went to the sixth grade. Um, some uh, didn't have any opportunity whatsoever. So when we come to uh, applying for citizenship, after you journeyed, all the different statuses, whether you started as an asylum seeker, a refugee, maybe you were undocumented, you finally were able to get your green card. Once you have a green card, um, with some exceptions, you have to wait five years in order to then apply for citizenship. But in addition to the fee, you have to pass um, a, an English test and you also have to pass a um, civics test. Now imagine how incredibly difficult it is for individuals who have never stepped maybe into a classroom to now take these, um, these tests. Um, so what we do at CheerLab is we help them with their citizenship classes. Um, we really recognize what their literacy rate is um, and engage them so that they don't see citizenship as um, a, um, a goal that is too, too much for them to reach. Another thing that is important is that most of the individuals who live in California who are eligible to become citizens have been in the country for more than 20 years. More over a million individuals of all the ones that I've described of the population um, uh, were, um, uh, have been in the country for many, many years. The last thing I wanna just add is um, the state of California with organizations like ourselves have partnered to do two things. Number one, is to create programs for naturalization that are accessible to low wage earners um, so that these, um, the naturalization is free of charge. But in addition to that, they've also partnered with us to provide naturalization fee assistance so that then the economics is not such a high barrier that then people don't become citizens. I have a question for you, mm -hmm. uh, What What um, uh, percentage of the people who you serve are economic refugees. In other words, um, they, they, they come here for greater opportunity, greater education, but they would be perfectly safe staying where they are um, in, or their family staying where they, in the countries of origin. Um, and what percentage are people who are fleeing real uh, fear of, of physical harm and, and abuse and, and uh, restrictions on their freedom? Uh, well, I would say that uh, it's it's mixed, right? So we work with a lot of individuals from Mexico, from Central America, and um, are working very closely with folks um, who uh, come from Afghanistan. Now, I, I guess maybe I have a different perspective on this. If you are not able to put food on your table and your children are dying of hunger, 
and you are not able to uh, advance uh, many times, especially in these small villages, for example, in Mexico, um, where there are situations where um, organized crime is so rampant um, that you cannot actually uh, survive. And so, in I think so what that you're saying is that is that you can be a refugee, not because your government is threatening you, but you can be a refugee because uh, gangs are threatening you. Um, whether it's uh, organized crime, whether it's in Central America or in Mexico, what I think is important for us to just understand is most people do not want to leave their home country. This is where their ancestors are. This is where their roots are, their, their, their family, their extended family. What motivates people to come to the United States in vast majority is their inability to actually have a safe and um, uh, livelihood the ability to have that life um, that any, uh, any of us uh, wish for our families and for ourselves, put you know, with shelter, with food on the table, um, with the ability to provide for your family. When that is, those, those basic needs are not met, then people um, are forced to come to the United States. And I think the only thing I would say add to, in terms of our topic, which is citizenship, is people have journeyed, have gone through so much that when they finally take the oath of citizenship of the United States, it is an emotional moment um, because it is that moment in, in which they finally maybe feel protected. Because even if you're a legal permanent resident, you can be deported from the United right. States. Right. So, so that, that ability of you finally feeling like, okay, I'm finally a U.S. citizen is a very emotional moment for many of the immigrants who finally um, get to that point. Mitra, Mark, I, I, could I just add one quick thing just for clarification? I think it's important to say that in the United States, um, you cannot be an economic refugee. I, I understand you were talking about that, not in the technical sense, but in the right. technical sense of a refugee, you have to be fleeing religious or political persecution or affiliation with a group um, or race. So you cannot come here and get refugees. First of all, you, you have to get refugee status outside your country. And for people from Mexico, from people from Central America, they've been excluded from even getting that status, becoming a refugee. So many of them are forced to come over the border and be undocumented because there's not a pathway for them. Right. Um, there's a little bit of change on that front, but it's very small. So um, that is definitely something that we advocate for, for is uh, providing legal pathways for people to come through the country so that they don't have to go through um, the harrowing They've already been through harrowing, harrowing circumstances because especially um, Central America of all the gangs and the violence, kids are very in danger. Um, so, and, and, and just at, uh, to say that the immigration program is much larger than the refugee program is very small compared to the number of immigrants allowed in the country. So it's about a million per year of immigrants that are allowed to come to the United States. The refugee program about average is about 90,000 per year. You know, thank you too. That's 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 such an important point, right? The the definitions are really important because, and, and I'm sorry that I that I misused the definition. No, that's okay. <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, people are being mischaracterized, and because they're being mischaracterized, you can't even have a discussion, right? Right. So thank you very much. Um, I wanted to just uh, check in with uh, Mitra because I can confirm that my grandparents did not want to leave their countries. Even though they were in economic distress on the one side, they were happy. Uh, you know, they were not. They were they were eking out a living, and they wanted to stay where they were. Um, and on the other side, you know, when when my grandfather got arrested by uh, the Gestapo and so on and so forth, he didn't want to leave. They were forced to leave. Me too. Do, do you find and, and, and my wife, right? Her 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 sisters, yeah. mother. They didn't want to leave the Philippines, right? Um, yeah, I know that's a very true statement. That's a very true statement. And again, you took it to the personal. I'll take it to our personal. We loved our country. Iran was a great country. And we thought that this revolution was short term lived and the violence would soon quell 40 years later. And now it's in the news every day for a few weeks now, ironically. But um, I think Americans don't realize that what a price we pay in abandoning our families, our friends, our food, our culture, our, just the comforts of home and what a price we've paid. And I wanna say Angelica is so right. It's such an emotional moment when you become a US citizen and you finally say, I have given so much 
in this journey to be here in this moment to finally belong. So, yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question, but I think well, yeah. it does. And and also the willingness to give more the the uh, idea of loyalty, and we see it in mm-hmm. service to to uh, military. We see it to uh, in terms of of how many um, immigrants, uh, new mm-hmm. citizens build businesses and really uh, participate in civic society. It really is is additive. So let's talk a little bit about uh, solving this 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 debate that we have, which seems to constantly go nowhere. Um, mm-hmm. it, seems, it seems that we've got in, in government a whole bunch of people who have it within their ability to start making the, the processes better, uh, to deal with the fact that we have a bunch of, of people who are labor markets need uh, coming into the United States, but we have no way of giving them a temporary work visas and, and that kind of thing. Um, we have our past, the citizenships are fraught and they they change with, with the political wins. How can we improve the situation? Let's start with you, Jane. How can we get a, a, a series of compromises where we together are able to um, address these issues and improve things for everybody involved. I mean, improve things for the border states, improve things for. Um, but Mark, can I just interject that question? The way it's framed is we need to clarify that. Okay. You're confounding the whole immigration spectrum from visas, entry, to so on. If That's today right. we're talking citizenship. about citizenship, then we're talking about an application fee, about um, the test about the civic and English exam, that is that final gate. And today we're talking about that. We're not talking about the borders, refugees, asylum, or whatever. So sorry, Jane, to steal your thunder. I was was treating it, you're right, I was treating it as a continuum and then we would like to move on to citizenship. But go ahead, Jane. Well, yeah, no, thanks, Mark. I just want to comment about your comment about economics um, and the labor market. Uh, In Minnesota, 97% of the new workers in our state are immigrants. 97% of the new workers in our state are immigrants. And that's from our statistic from our Department of Labor. That just tells you the future of our state is dependent upon immigrants because Minnesotans and Americans at large, it varies a bit from state to state, but they're, they're not having the number of kids that we need to sustain our labor market. And we, you know, economists don't, don't, have any way to incent that, right? So um, they're critical to our economy. And most people, not enough people talk about that enough and understand that, the data behind that. Um, but I, I think I, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm really an optimist and I, I, I think I'm not very optimistic at the national level um, of, of getting immigration reform. I don't think anybody is. Um, so because it's become a political wedge, but there are things that you can do locally and in your state. And, you know, one, one, one thing that, um, is really helpful to our clients is 60, over 60% of our clients that apply for citizenship get a fee waiver. So, because if you know, uh, $725 a person, and if you have a family of 10, that's a serious investment. So it's over 60% of our clients that apply for your citizenship are getting a fee waiver. So they're not, um, or, or a fee reduction. So they're most often not having to pay for any of it or the majority of the So cost. that's something, who, who, get, who grants the fee waiver? Um, that's, it's a federal program. Um, and so, so that's, I don't know who, it, we have to apply to USCIS. We have to send the information mm-hmm. to USCIS. It's- there's a form, there's an application waiver form in the state of Massachusetts. If you qualify for benefits such as food subsidy or mass health, you automatically can apply for a fee waiver. It's a special application. We file for it. And it's 72% of our clients at Project Citizenship qualify for a fee waiver. So that's something that, that can be done. And uh, Angelica, um, are there other things that we can do to make this a more rational uh, process and and an easier process. Yeah. Um, yes, there's so many so much that can be done um, in terms of really making the immigration system more humane, um, more manageable, um, making uh, our immigration system actually work for our for our modern world. 
And so from um, as Chirla, we work very closely with um, what we call mixed status immigrants. So that it could be individuals who have asylum, uh, individuals um, who are refugees, um, individuals who are undocumented in this country. And that's the vast majority of individuals um, who we work with. And these are individuals who don't have any level of legal status. They came, came here maybe on, on different uh, visas. Those visas expired, they're undocumented. And then others obviously um, also came to the United States um, um, through the border without inspection. Um, and then we work with individuals who are legal permanent residents, our green card holders, and also with individuals who are citizens of the United States. So we work with um, the, the vast range of individuals with all the different statuses. Our perspective is that our immigration system as it, as it exists um, does not meet the needs of, of of migration in this in this world. Number one, um, there are people fleeing uh, from their home countries because of war and violence and persecution. Um, and we have very few um, uh, opportunities for them to come because the refugee numbers are so low in comparison to the need. Um, there is obviously uh, every year a push um, to make those numbers um, closer to the reality of the need. Um, and and find that, that in our poll, by the way, Angelica, we find that the respondents, when we ask what are the three top reasons people seek to become U.S. citizens, um, the the top reason is freedom from fear. Freedom from fear. Yes. Absolutely. Freedom from fear. Um, a absolutely. Um, and my colleagues can, um, uh, you know, update on any of the numbers, but at least um, the numbers that I have is um, over 65 million individuals are fleeing their home country, their, their home countries, their countries of origin um, because of persecution and political strife. Um, yet, um, I think we were struggling to get 125,000 individuals into this country on a yearly basis. Um, and the, you know, the last four years with, um, with the previous administration, the Trump administration, those numbers were to the floor. They were, they were just so small in terms of the need um, in, 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 in comparison to the need. And that's just on the refugee side. Um, asylum seekers are being turned back at our border, even though they have very legitimate um, uh, need um, to, uh, and, and the reasons they're fleeing require protection in this country. So our asylum system needs to be, to adhere um, to international law, but it also needs to uh, recognize what's happening in our very own hemisphere. And then the undocumented population. So I work very closely with the undocumented population, um, who have, many of who have been here for decades and decades. And, there, and this is where in Congress, there, um, there is more willingness um, to actually use immigration as a political football than actually create solutions for the people who are contributing to this country, um, who, them, who are undocumented. So I've been part so of many of we, the- How mm -hmm. do we, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, how do, how do we, get is since we have this huge immigration uh, issue right and then there is a then there are, are are people who have gone through this this process and they're trying to become citizens what kind of changes can be made in the citizenship uh, process uh, we already talked with jane about this whole idea of the fee waiver do you have a particular wish that you would see on the citizenship side that, that the US government could enact? Well, the, I, I think maybe just to sort of just finish my thought on, on, on this, um, on, the immigrate, on the undocumented migration is that in order for you to get to the citizenship part, you first have to be able to have access to a green card. Right. And so access to a green card varies depending on what country you're coming from. So that your country of origin determines how long you're gonna be able to how long you have to wait to become a green card holder. And then that determines your access point to citizenship. And I don't think people understand that very well. So if I could change things, I would actually, um, it, you know, do away with some of the quotas and the, ca the caps for some of the home countries, especially um, Mexico, the Philippines that are wake have decades long waits. Um, in that way, they become legal permanent residents and then have access to citizenship. Um, we could do so. They're not applying for citizenship. That doesn't solve it, Angelica. You're just saying to add more people to the LPRs. What, but I think Mark is asking, how do we simplify the citizenship process so that we get more people through? I think that we can't keep talking about the spectrum. Yes, there's so many issues, but I keep thinking we're 
this is a whole citizenship conversation. So well, how do we, what's your wish list for the citizenship? Well, I think I, I think that there 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 is a uh, connection, Mitra. I think that what An- Angelica is saying is that the pipeline um, to citizenship depends on the pipeline for the green cards, and I That's think right. that, that okay. what so, what what. It, I, but then we'll get more people. No, I disagree with both of you. Then we get more people as LPRs. We have to think what's that final gate, and how do we then become make them? Well, what we do, we work society. with people depending on their age and their English level. So we have a whole program just for many of the individuals who have not applied for citizenship are older immigrants. So we work very closely with them. We call it, you know, senior citizens, right? So that they really uh, you become real senior citizens uh, of the United States. And so we work with the administration and we worked um, with our local community to make sure that these senior citizens are actually able to go through the process. And we have very special targeted programs for them because these are some of the individuals based on our own data uh, data uh, in California that a majority of them have been here for a long, long time. Many of them are from Mexican ancestry. So we do very targeted uh, um, campaigns to go directly to the Mexican community to answer what are some of the, the barriers. I mean, for them, ask ask them, what are your barriers? And then for us to then work with them in, in, in motivating uh, individuals. Um, yeah. Many of them don't know that there are resources to support them economically. So we make those in, that information available. We partner with ethnic media, with radio to get that information. And this is how we have been able in California to increase between 2016 and, um, and the present um, over 2.5 million individuals who have now um, become citizens, which in average was an average of about 100,000 uh, a year. So for me, um, these are some of the tactics that are working. And I think more partnership at the national level and more partnership at the local level to um, make this a, an important um, uh, goal, um, I, th- I think really helps our community. Well, I'm surprised you haven't brought up the N-400 application that's so archaic, that's 20 yeah, pages long, is. and it still asks whether you've ever been a prostitute or whether you belong to the Nazi um, party. You're a communist. You're committed polygamy. Yes. Well, I, I agree with so you. Many I, try. I agree with you. I think that I'm yeah. pretty sure that you and I agree. So I would love I know, to. I know I agree, but we're talking, I think we just, we're not tackling the problem. I, I think, I, I think if we didn't have, we have 9.1 million uh, LPRs that are not applying for citizenship. So we can, we're not putting a dent in it. Maybe you're successful in California. We are not successful in Massachusetts. I think a big thing that would really help is the processing time, Mark, as Mitra talked about. I mean, again, in Minnesota, the same thing. It was six months. Uh, at one point, it was three months. Um, so the processing time would really help. So if someone wants to vote, they have to apply now. So I think the length of the application, as Mitra said, that some of the questions are absurd. Um, and 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 then, you know, we do have the waiver program, which really helps people. And the good some, some good news is that 90, uh, the national passing rate is 94% um, for citizenship, which is pretty remarkable. And I'm going to break because we have such a great team. Our, I'm, I'm sure these guys have similar statistics, but our passing rate is 96%. We track the clients that we serve. So, and it just speaks to the help that people really need because people don't understand the process. It's complex and um, people are scared of it. They're, um, they really need help navigating it, which is Definitely what, you know, Mitra's organization, Angelica and our organization are doing and, and that navigation is very, very important because the other thing is if someone has committed a crime, we have to help people work through that so they don't just put in an application that's going to get them in trouble. Um, so those kind of services are really, really key. So, th- so our, there are things that really work well about the program, but there's definitely things that can be improved. And those are two big things right there. The thing that really strikes me about this discussion is that the U.S. government provides a context which, as we've discussed, is is not particularly efficient. The process itself, the okay. forms, uh, can be onerous and terribly outdated. Um, and then you, each in your different states, each with your different constituencies, are providing a response that complements the U.S. government uh, government in terms of helping people move through this process. This is just such an incredibly valuable service that you and your staff and your board and your volunteers 
uh, provide. I'd like to, to really thank you for illuminating it. Angelica Salas, Executive Director, Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights, Dr. Mitra Savarini, Executive Director of Project Citizenship in Massachusetts, and Jane Graupman, Executive Director of the International Institute of Minnesota. Thank you so much for illuminating this really complicated process uh, for us. And please thank everybody involved. You, you are our heroes. And thank you. Thank you for your service to those trying to become American citizenship. Citizens. Thank you. Take care.